everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. The technological singularity seems to be on our doorsteps. With the increasing power of computers, artificial intelligence, robotics, and other technologies, we are getting closer to building a machine that will be more intelligent than us. So if a superhuman intelligence were to be developed tomorrow through artificial intelligence and technological singularity is inevitable, it would give humans and human intelligence greater problem-solving potential than current humans are capable of. Furthermore, the development of artificial superintelligence, in short referred to as ASI, will trigger tremendous technological growth, resulting in endless changes to human civilization in cyberspace, geospace, space, and the spaces we don't even know yet. So as we evaluate the potential of artificial intelligence becoming self-improving, perhaps autonomous, and leading to singularity, it is important to evaluate where the impact of limitless machine intelligence is taking humanity and what are its potential risks and rewards. To discuss artificial intelligence-driven technological singularity further, I'm delighted to welcome David Wood to this roundup. David is a principal at Delta Wisdom, chair at London Futurist, and a pioneer of the smartphone industry. He is based in UK. Welcome, David. We are so very honored to have you on Risk Roundup. It's my pleasure to be here, and thanks for picking such an important topic. Wonderful, David, and thank you so much for that. So from where we are today, David, when would human intelligence be surpassed by artificial intelligence? What seems to be the timeline? So it's not possible to give any fixed prediction. I don't believe we can draw a simple line on a graph and say we are here today and follow a curve or follow a straight line and therefore by a particular date we will definitely have a artificial general intelligence, which by the way would match human reasoning in all capabilities. After all, artificial intelligence already surpasses human intelligence in very many characteristics, but there are other human characteristics which yet artificial intelligence lacks. Things like common sense, we might say, and we might uh, look at uh, being able to infer causes, seeing beyond patterns to abstraction and so on. It's hard to be sure, but there's certainly a number of things which artificial intelligence today can't do. And if we try and pin down when it will be possible, the first difficulty we have is that we can't know the unknown. In other words, we don't exactly know what research breakthroughs are needed before these uh, jumps can take place. However, people can give a statistical range of probabilities, and many people have tried to do that. What you can ask an expert to do is say, well, by what date do you think there's a 50% chance that we'll have artificial general intelligence? And when you do that with a group of different specialists, their estimates are all over the place. Some might say it's not going to happen for another century. Some people say it will never happen. But the majority of dates comes out sooner than that. And roughly speaking, when you do this, you get an average median expectation of about 2050, which is around the middle of this century. You yes. can say, when would you like a more confidence if you wanted to be 90% sure that we'll have this? Assuming that we don't destroy ourselves by other means in the meantime, people will pick a date towards the end of the century, maybe in the 2070s or 2080s. But most interestingly, if you ask people, what's the date by which you think there's a, at least a 10% chance, so a small chance, but not out of the question, a 10% chance in which we might have artificial general intelligence, and the dates vary, of course, again, but the median of these dates, the average of these dates is about... 2025 thereabouts and i personally would back that up from my own assessment i think there's a slim chance maybe 20 percent uh, 10 percent chance that we will have artificial general intelligence by 2025 even though that's only now six years ahead 
Yes, no, I, I, I agree with you because there are so many different variables that we have to consider and evaluate to be able to forecast uh, any given date. And it is still impossible. Even if we look at all different variables, we just don't know what kind of developments are happen happening in which country and who is working on what. And there is no way to know at what stage their development is. And uh, at the same time, we are seeing right now there are so many autonomous systems already you know, in use. Their work, there a lot of them, you know, are uh, being uh, also applied commercially. I had a risk roundup yesterday on autonomous systems, and there are so many developments happening all across nations. So even if you look at the development of the autonomous systems, do you think that at some point AI development will become autonomous? Or I, I think it is already becoming autonomous in certain ways. But once it becomes autonomous, and one autonomous system will start talking to another autonomous system, and then the nature of the advances that will happen on, on its own, that probably will you know, bring in the some sort of uh, advancement that some people might want to you know say that it's a technological singularity and it's going to become inevitable so do you see that based on the development in the autonomous systems across nations in us in china in even in some african nations in uh, russia in uh, so many places do you see that that is going to play a role in reaching the technological singularity and it's going to make it inevitable in the coming years well, I don't want to say it's inevitable. There are various things that might happen which will stop us getting to a singularity, mainly a political disaster of one sort or another. We might have some uh, catastrophe of global warming going badly wrong, or there might be an outbreak of accidental nuclear war, or it's possible that we might turn against science and engineering for some reason. I don't think I want to say it's inevitable, but as things are going today, it's quite likely, maybe highly likely that at some stage in the next few decades we will get there. And you're quite right to point out that one way we're going to get there faster is when autonomous systems themselves are involved in the design of the next generation of autonomous systems. And that's already happening. It's a bit like I mean, the Industrial Revolution. Let's go back a bit. What was that? It was we discovered how to power tools with things like steam. And we had simple tools. And the simple tools helped to build better machinery, which built better tools, which built better machinery. And, uh, and quite rapidly, we had much better systems. If we look at the third industrial revolution, which is the advent of computers and information systems. At first, it was very difficult to build a computer. You used a hammer and nail almost, and you design them on paper and pencil. But there's a discipline called computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, which allows computers to be helpful to design and manufacture other things. And guess what? Computers are involved in the design and manufacturing of the next generation of computers. And the next again. Of course, humans are still in the loop, but the human power is magnified more and more. It's the same with software. Why does software get better? It's because human software engineers take advantage of one generation of software to be able to build the next generation of software better. And then to come back to your point, it's the same with AI. Already AI engineers are taking advantage of one generation of AI tools to more quickly build the more sophisticated next generation. If you look at something that Google's team have done, it was done by the Google Brain team led by Jeff Dean. There is something that allows a, a deep learning system to design a model for solving particular new problems. And that can, in some cases, come up with a better design more efficiently than what human software engineers might do. This is called AutoML, their system. And of course, it can't do everything yet by any means, but it's one sign along the way that autonomous systems are already helping people to go faster. And what I expect is that probably at some stage there'll be another one or two minor but significant breakthroughs, and that the companies or the countries who have these breakthroughs at their disposal will suddenly go much, much faster than ever before. And within a short period of time, the combination of smart humans and smart AIs will bring AI to the level at which the human involvement is no longer necessary. And at that stage, it'll go even faster again. The AI will be able to do its own research. So rather than waiting for humans to read research papers, to study every link on Wikipedia and figure out which of these 
ideas are the most sensible ones. At some stage, we will have AI, which is able to do that reading by itself and at much greater scale than any humans can do. And it will be able to absorb all of the publications and it will say, ah, here's an obscure idea from a journal in Hungary. You know, maybe this is the one that makes a difference. And quite possibly it will be breakthroughs in people in disconnected places like in Africa. Several African countries already have come quite interesting AI research groups. There's one in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, for example. There's plenty of research being done in India and China, in some case, by some measures, already leading the world in research here. So these different groups are working in ways that's not always visible. And it's quite likely at some stage, one of these groups is going to stumble upon an incremental improvement, which suddenly allows their own research to accelerate away. And that's what's called the singularity. Yes, very true. At the same time, uh, there is also this geopolitics of artificial intelligence that we all need to be very mindful about because the weaponization of artificial intelligence is already happening. The AI is a transparent layer and it's being added to uh, almost all weapons now. And uh, not only that, when the artificial intelligence is being used as a weapon and uh, we just don't know how it's going to end. That is just one scenario that is really terrifying because as we are doing the progress with this, you know, artificial intelligence development and advances, at the same time, there is a lot of progress happening in the weaponization of AI, which should be very terrifying to the, not only the creators and developers of AI, but to entire human, uh, you know, race, because it is, we just don't know where it's going to end. And at the same time, if we look at, the accelerating progress of this AI and the changes in the mode of human life across it is all the human ecosystem that we know yet at this point, that means cyberspace, geospace, space, which will give us an indicator of the approaching singularity in the history of the human race, beyond which human affairs in cyberspace, geospace and space, as we know now, would not continue in the same manner so many most of the jobs will be gone so what are what is human what are humans going to do at at that point what happens to human intelligence and the human race at that point because if, when we look, evaluate the advances in the neuroscience that if you don't learn keep learning new skills there is a change happening in your human brain so if we if, if all the jobs are taken up by you know artificial intelligence and uh, humans don't have pretty much anything to do then what is going to be the evolutionary impact on the human brain human intelligence so that is another you know point that i really am concerned about that what happens to human intelligence and the human race at that point provided that no advances are happening for the human intelligence enhancing the human intelligence and that we are not moving aggressively towards you know using the gene editing and other technologies to enhance the human intelligence. So what happens to human intelligence? Well, so many fascinating questions, and uh, I hope we have the chance to explore uh, quite a few of these points. Uh, you know, one reason it's called the singularity is, and the term was popularized by a science fiction writer uh, called Werner Vinge, who also happened to be a professor of mathematics and computer science. He still writes science fiction, by the way. But in about the 1980s, he was trying to speculate, well, what kind of plot situations would be involved if there really is a, a smarter than human intelligence around? And he came to the realization, actually, we can't say, because these intelligences are going to be motivated by things that are beyond our present conception. It's almost like, you know, imagine if the apes in the African savannah had a big uh, conference eight million years ago, and somehow they knew that their brains were getting better, potentially in the future. And they started to wonder, what will we do with our better brains? And some of them might say, you know, we like bananas, we apes. Maybe in the future, with our intelligence, we'll have more bananas. But they would not have been able to conceive of things like Pythagoras' theorem, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the marvels of literature such as Hamlet and Breaking Bad. They would not have conceived of going to visit the moons in Jupiter. So in a similar way, it's very hard for us to conceive exactly what we will do when there are gr much greater intelligence than what we've got today. But we can try and get there stage by stage. And one idea is that uh, with our greater brains, we'll be able to do more creations and more explorations than we have today. 
So the things we like to explore, whether it's music, whether it's, well, in my case, I love exploring mathematics. Uh, I think more people would actually love to explore it once they had a chance to see it. There's literature, there's the planet, uh, there's the whole solar system. Indeed, I mentioned the moons of Jupiter. Maybe some stage we'll go there. Then there will be virtual worlds that we create. So at the very least, I imagine with our enhanced intelligence, which we can talk more about in a minute, which is a combination of us using AIs as our partners and tools, but also, as you've suggested, with our brains being enhanced by perhaps gene editing and perhaps by other neurotechnology. If we have that, we might be able to spend more of our time uh, being more human than we are now, freed from the limitations which often uh, dominate us and suppress us. So we'll have more chance to explore, as I said, more music, more art, more mathematics, more of the different worlds. But this involves us uh, being somehow partners with these artificial intelligences. It involves us in some sense uh, becoming smarter too. I think that's certainly possible. I think that our brains are by no means the pinnacle of uh, what could be conceived. We have managed to enhance some parts of our bodies already. Ten years ago, I had my eyes lasered. Uh, it was a scary thing, but I'm very glad I did. So that meant that after 40 years of being quite short-sighted, suddenly I had much better eyesight. And I would say I look forward Half jokingly, I say I look forward to having my brain lasered too. Not that I actually want laser beams in my brain, but I want a similar kind of stimulation to make my brain work better than before. Maybe more reliable memory, defragmenting, to borrow a term from computer science, some of the memories, more brain cells, and also connecting it somehow onto the internet more seamlessly. Now, I don't think that our human brains will improve as quickly as completely silicon brains. I think they will leave us behind. But if we do it right, then there, there will still be some kind of a partnership and trust for us. And they might even become like the deities of old religions. You know, they will look after us creating in a safe environment for us to explore. And we'll still have challenges and issues and great adventures but there will no longer be the kinds of soul-destroying challenges and deep oppression, which sadly has been the lot of far too many people throughout history so far. So that's the big picture of what we might achieve, even though we can't see it very clearly, at least we can start to conceive it and see how it might be. So I, I hear your point on that. And it's likely that if we, if these developers, creators of AI, if they start putting in the code, in the artificial intelligence code that they, they have to work for the human interest that so no matter what even if we reach the you know a artificial super intelligence and re reach the singularity then that perhaps would mean that you know they would have a human interest at heart but if if the developers and if this uh, ai community is not able to put that code put the purpose for the ai in the code that they have to work for human interest, then that would mean that we are creating another intelligent species with so much intelligence more than us, and they will not have human interest at heart. So that is terrifying a lot of people, and that is you know creating a lot of uh, challenges because if we look at it right now, that we already have the bias in the AI. The algorithms are already biased, so all the human uh issues that we have like prejudice you know uh, and uh, sexism and you know uh, all the, the bias against you know different uh, for different uh, kind of variables all that is already in the so many algorithms so all algorithms are already biased and if we are not able to prevent that at this point then how do we know that we will not be able to uh, prevent the human component that the ai has to work for the human interest that their goal and purpose is to look after the you know human interest and human goals if we are not able to do about the bias at this point then how are we going to do that at uh, when we reach the singularity? So I think this is perhaps the most important question of all. It's us, we have to figure out what we really want uh, humans to be, what we want humans to, how we want humans to flourish. And there are, of course, many ideas people have, but often these ideas, if you develop them further, they become somehow imbalanced. So somebody may say their idea of uh, humanity is happiness, you know, this is what humans should be. 
well, if we're not careful, we might end up with a kind of, people call it a pig happiness, you know, it's a kind of ha, 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 but it's not actually the, the deepest fulfillment of human uh, flourishing. I mean, in some uh, bizarre case, you might imagine that uh, machines may say, well, humans want to be happy. We can make them happy easily enough. And they drug us up. They might connect electrodes to our brains. And we might uh, have a 24-hour-a-day orgasm seven days a week, you know. And at some stage, in some way, we're de delighted. But at another part of our brain, we think, actually, this wasn't what we wanted. You know, this wasn't really. There's more to humans than this. So it's not just about the suit of happiness. There's something more. And can we pick? Can we pin down what it is that we'd like? The risk is that we will ask uh, the robots or the AIs to serve us, but we won't give them a clear enough specification, and they will take what they give us and they will develop it too far. Consider making profits. You know, many people say, well, if a, if a company is making lots of profits, they must be doing good in the world. They must be meeting real human needs. But if that's all the goal that, I, uh, that uh, an AI had, which would be to make more and more money for its company, then you can easily see lots of ways in which that could go wrong. And there are corporations which uh, come into monopoly powers and they end up causing a lot of human grief at the same time as they're generating profits. So to answer your question, how can we ensure that we guide the robots correctly? We have to answer some age-old questions. Well, what is the true flourishing of humans? And uh, it's going to require us to draw upon the best of our historical understanding, integrating the insights from many different cultures, but also reflecting on what the best is that science has to teach us. And science is showing us a little bit more about how the brain works and what makes the brain uh, satisfied. And I think this area needs a, a lot more attention. Thankfully, there are ethics guidance groups uh, attached to many of the world's leading high-tech companies, but they're still at very early days. And the risk is that the engineers who want to develop the software quickly will get ahead of the people who are thinking in terms of the safety and in terms of the ethics and in terms of the human flourishing. I don't want the implementation to slow down, particularly, because I want to get the benefits of superintelligence for many hard problems of human life quickly. For example, I want to get the superintelligence to help us to solve the problems of cancer and dementia and aging, the right solutions to climate change, the right solutions to social inequality. I want to get that quickly, but I am afraid that uh, that engineering approach may get ahead of the safety engineering, the ethics understanding. So that's why I'm so glad that we're having this discussion now, because I want more people to say, they want to put more time into developing a rich and a profound understanding of ethics rather than just a simple, here's a few words. Because when you take these few words and magnify them, they often end up with something distorted. A bit like King Midas, you know, this old story from ancient Greece. King Midas said, oh, I love gold. Oh, it would be great if everything I touched turned to gold. But when it came literally true, he touched his food, it turned to gold. He touched his beloved daughter, she turned to gold. Now, no software engineer is going to do something as foolish as that, but we might do something equally counterproductive in a more sophisticated and a more subtle way, and we might then regret it. We hadn't thought it through. Sure, no, you are right. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm not implying that any software engineer or coder is going to do this on purpose. Some, I mean, there may be some who would want to harm the humanity, but mostly nobody wants to do that. And uh, what, whatever is gets inserted in the code may happen unknowingly and they may not realize that the ramifications of that would be so big. Now, uh, that is a, a debate that we have been having that, you know, should we go after functionality and uh, get it out in the market and commercialize it very quickly so that we are the first in the race? Or should we be have a very balanced approach and, you know, think of all the risk and variables and before we, you know, release that uh, whatever product we are trying to develop and it's we all want super intelligence because you know it will help us solve many many problems that for humanity like you know so man you know figuring out how to uh, get rid of cancer figuring out how to you know manage the global warming or how to get rid of that and save you our planet and you know how to explore the other you know planets and there are so many things that we would like more intelligence for but 
how we reach that stage it's not that you know there is only one path to achieving that super intelligence there are more than you know one different uh, roads that can take us there for example uh, one we talked about autonomous systems but there is also this uh, uh, we can get uh, enhancement of human intelligence through human to computer interface and that also can give us intelligence amplification we can take the path of uh, directly increasing our intelligence by neurological operation if we i mean the advances that are happening in neuroscience perhaps it would give us a way to directly in, enhance intelligence we will have brain to brain communication we will have a brain net and that we can replace internet and we will be able to have a collective intelligence in a very meaningful way we will have uh, also there is the networks and computers and databases and the internet of things and all that you know connected that can be enhance our intelligence and we can have a network of uh, embedded microprocessors and uh, that will you know take us towards being a superhuman being so there is not one path that can take us to, or that can amplify our intelligence but one that i am really you know very interested in is the collective human intelligence because in what these internet and communications information communication technology has done is that it has allowed us to connect each and every individual now we have a means and way to talk to each other to you know connect with each other now with further advances in the not only blockchain but the nature of the chips that are coming over way we will be able to have a collective human intelligence in a more meaningful way so what difference do you see emerging from artificial super intelligence achieved by any of the scenarios that we just talked or even collective machine intelligence or collective human intelligence what would be the ideal way to go forward because i would always bank on collective human intelligence i would always bet on that then you know bet on an intelligence that we are creating where we may or may not have any control in the coming years so like you i'm a big fan of the potential of collective human intelligence i look at things like wikipedia which is collectively produced more generally i look at science science has been a collective endeavor and the principles of science uh, have gone beyond the individual fallibilities and biases and prejudices of individual scientists now, uh, I think it's very important that we can draw upon the wisdom of the whole of this community and we can learn to listen to dissenting and different points of view and we can figure out how to get the insights that uh, draw upon uh, the wisdom from many different traditions and many uh, new uh, points of view as well. But uh, sometimes instead of the wisdom of crowds, there's the madness of crowds. Sometimes we end up in uh, tribal uh, situations and sometimes we, instead of uh, getting smarter through the internet, we get uh, more angry through the internet. And you already mentioned the ways in which sometimes software is released without uh, ever be understanding all its implications. Well, I have to point to Facebook as an example. For many years, the unofficial motto of Facebook, or actually the official motto in some cases, was move fast and break things. The idea uh, was that if the team wasn't occasionally breaking the software, they were going too slow, and they needed to take more risks. Now, what's happened with this? Many of the original engineers and founders of Facebook are sort of horrified at what they've achieved, and they are coming out in the next, last few years with uh, big regret stories. They said things like, well, we knew we were messing around with human psychology, making people click things that maybe wasn't particularly good for them, but we thought, it's all right, you know, it's not going to cause any real harm. And now they look at the way in which the tribal instincts have been raised up by Facebook and people are more concerned just to champion their own point of view rather than trying to build bridges. The way in which uh, Facebook seems to have been exploited with uh, carefully targeted advertisements to fringe voters to push them in one direction rather than another. And maybe it's had a significant influence on the edge of uh, various uh, elections around the world, such as the election in America in 2016 and such as the Brexit referendum. And people who were working with Facebook regret it and they say, what could we have done? 
Well, the answer is you should have thought more about it beforehand. And that's exactly what you and I are urging uh, the engineers of the world to do in the future. It's no longer acceptable to have that kind of let's break it and break it and eventually we'll get it right. Because now the technology is at such a level that if it does get broken, suddenly there's no planet left anymore. You know, in the old days, if fire went wrong, then eventually humans managed to invent things like the fire extinguisher and the fire engines. But if we get the artificial general intelligence wrong, then it's too late. You know, there may not be any uh, meaningful human society left afterwards. So let's endeavor to get the true greatness out of human uh, insight from around the world and let's put this onto a drawing board a kind of wiki a wikipedia if you like let's have this discussion it is happening there are groups of people around the world there is the the uh, partnership on ai which was set up after meetings in uh, puerto rico a couple of years ago, and then more recently, a big meeting at the start of the year in uh, Asilomar, California, in which people with multiple different backgrounds, non-government organizations, social advocacy organizations, economists, some politicians, and a lot of uh, academics and people from uh, high-tech companies, they did get together and they've drawn up there at the Asilomar. They drew up what's called the 23 Asilomar Principles for Beneficial AI. And they know it's not the final word by any means. They know there's still a lot of work to be doing, but it's a starting point. So it's collective intelligence is coming along, but there's still a great deal of work to be done. And the risk is, as you pointed out, there is sort of a geopolitical competition going on. And people realize, as actually Vladimir Putin said in an answer he gave uh, some time ago, about the future of AI. He said, well, AI, it's very powerful. Uh, it could be dangerous, but by the way, whoever becomes the leader in AI will rule the world. What's that effect? And uh, I, mean, I like many Russians greatly, but I don't particularly want the Vladimir Putin's regime to rule the world, uh, especially but we have to realize that AI is going to make people's capability in cyber espionage much more powerful, as well as their capabilities in uh, missiles, normal missiles. And other countries realize this as well. Other countries realizing, we, we, well, we've got to hurry up. And so with that sense of hurry up, hurry up, there is the risk that the safety and ethics issues gets left behind. So let's have the discussion that involves as many people from around the world, Chinese, Indian, uh, Russian, Europeans, Americans, Africans, Australians, and so on. Let's have a global collaboration to figure out how to avoid the runaway battles and uh, the wrong kinds of arms races. Let's ensure instead we're cooperating for the sake of getting to what could be a, a sustainable superabundance of human flourishing. Yes, no, absolutely. I think you made an excellent point there. And this human desire to control, to rule the world, that is, uh, you know, causing so many challenges. And if we look at this weaponization of AI and the geopolitical factors that are coming into play, it is, uh, it is creating and bringing to us a very terrifying scenario for uh, that, you know, we humans will kill each other even before we reach to the stage of uh, achieving the uh, singularity. So those risks are there and we have to make sure that we create enough education and awareness uh, like we are doing right now by having this more and more discussions so that we can involve more and more decision makers and perhaps create a better understanding of what is at stake and what risks are emerging because of the rat race that we are having because of the uh, uh, development in AI. But coming back to the point of, uh, I mean, what point you made about uh, the collective intelligence and the, how what role Facebook played in uh, the psychology and uh, creating all those uh, uh, human, you know, challenges because of the fake news, because of the psychological impact. Facebook is not the only, you know, so, um, uh, entity that uh, has created that. There are many more innovations emerging that would play a very big role in creating or influencing the psychology of humans in making them do what they want to do or even, you know, the 
virtual reality and you know many other uh, innovations that are emerging will play a much bigger role in the coming years so that is also something we have to be very mindful about how to prevent that kind of mass you know uh, influence the, by for whatever you know stakeholder whoever is behind it how to prevent that so that we don't allow that kind of influence on a global level or national level or you know so that uh, we have some sort of control over human intelligence and human thinking and analysis but for that would require many different developments now for intelligence improvements even in human or even if we are talking about artificial intelligence it is not just the software enhancement we are looking for we also need to be mindful about the hardware enhancement because right now there is so much focus on the software enhancement and uh, developing all these algorithms and autonomous systems but we are not focusing on enough on the hardware enhancement so do you see the need for developing a uh, better hardware because there are a lot of chips you know with that will not survive in the heat or they are not radiation resistant they are not heat resistant and there a lot of you know hardware uh, problems are there that will not uh, allow us to reach the level of intelligence that we we would like to achieve so do you see a need for a hardware enhancement so you're quite right. The hardware improvements uh, sometimes are not appreciated as much as they should be. But the one reason why deep learning has made so much progress in the last 10 years is because of a different kind of a hardware chip rather than the CPU, the central processing unit. Uh, there, many of the algorithms for deep learning have run on the GPU, the graphics processing unit, which was initially developed so that uh, teenagers and uh, older people would enjoy playing graphics games on their PCs and so on. And these uh, GPU chips were developed to make a uh, light work of multiple parallel processing. And it turned out that they were uh, suitable for running the kind of similar multiple processing that uh, trains deep learning. So the first jump up was from CPUs to GPUs. And although the CPUs aren't improving quite as much as they used to be, they're probably slower than uh, the traditional improvement of Moore's Law, which was roughly every 18 months they would double their power. Uh, that's slowed down a bit. It's more than once every 18 months now, but GPUs have been improving faster. And then the next step from GPUs is that many people said, well, these are wonderful chips, but they do too much. You know, we don't need all of the same things as for graphics games. So companies like Google created their own version, which they call TPU, a tensor processing unit. Tensor is a kind of mathematical matrix, and it's what they use in deep learning. It turns out that you can miss out some of the more sophisticated and expensive parts of the GPU and end up with the chips that are even more effective and more powerful. And uh, I think uh, there's already two and maybe three generations of TPUs. Other companies are developing this too, some startups and some big companies. And then, and then there's quantum computing. And quantum computing is very hard to predict exactly how much impact it's going to have. It's got a very different basis for its calculations. Traditional computing, which includes everything I've spoken about so far, relies on there being a careful distinction between a zero and a one. And algorithms all rely on that. But quantum computing, you end up with qubits or quantum bits, which have a much more well, it's complex in a mathematical sense. It uses complex numbers, a combination of zeros and ones, which somehow it exists in simultaneously. And there are certain kinds of algorithms, search algorithms and so on, which uh, would run much, much faster on quantum computers than even the most powerful uh, traditional computing. And we're not yet at the stage when we got big and uh, powerful enough quantum computers to actually do this. But people talk about the advent of quantum supremacy, perhaps, in the next... 12 months or 24 months. And if that were to happen, suddenly lots of things which were impossible before would be opened up. And again, it's hard to predict exactly what impact this will have on AI, but there are some people who think that suddenly this might make new versions of AI possible that weren't previously possible. Then there's more the idea of neuromorphic computing. Neuromorphic computing is when you understand what's happening inside the brain. Maybe you can copy some of the same processes and principles back into our AI systems. Because after all, the, the brain is incredibly efficient. It uses very little power. I mean, it uses 
a lot of the energy of a human you eat and a lot of the energy you get from your food goes to the brain compared to the other organs but still it's very efficient compared to the chips are based in silicon the nice people understand that more there's likely to be breakthroughs in the architecture too and many companies are looking at that so for all these reasons i think you're right there are likely to be significant changes in the performance of a ai in the years ahead because of breakthroughs in hardware design too yes yes that uh, that definitely is something that uh, we all have to be very careful about but at the same time all these algorithms i was thinking you know how they feed on the data i mean the more the data that we feed them the more they learn from that so as human intelligence and data drives the evolution of artificial intelligence machines are becoming familiar with not only human emotions but also uh, all our weaknesses and our warfare tendencies and now if all these algorithms uh, artificial intelligence start learning uh, on their own about everything that is published everything that is in the cyber domain everything that is in the books everything that is in the audios and what in whatever format we have the information out there if it starts you know learning from that we don't have control we have not made any effort of screening all that you know information and making sure that we want to feed only the good information that will protect the humanity we we haven't made any effort there are no initiatives across nations that have made any effort or there are no initiatives that i see where you know there is even a effort to figure out how to prevent certain kind of information from getting into the hands of you know ai so do you see a need for screening everything that is in published form in any form so that you know we don't feed that information to artificial intelligence to the algorithms to make sure that you know they don't learn certain things that would come come back and you know haunt us because that would become a very emerging threat for the survival and security of humanity so another great question uh First thing is we may not even be able to agree amongst ourselves. What are the good things we should be showing the AI and what are the bad things we should be hiding? Because although the, at a certain level there's agreement, there's agreement on say the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was uh, uh, drawn up about 1946, 1947 under the guidance of Eleanor Roosevelt and other people, which had input from around the world. Uh, but when you're trying to go a little bit beyond that, you end up with people having quite different views. You know, is Mother Teresa, was she a saint or was she a sinner? You know, and there are very strongly divergent views on that. And so we may have to, we can't just tell uh, currently the AI, this is exactly the right thing to follow and not. Second thing to say is that maybe we have to be able to let the AI study it, but give it enough guidance to say, well, when you're looking at all of this, then you have to realize various things in the sense that when children read uh, literature, they're aware that not every character in every uh, story, it deserves to be emulated. And often the characters that are there, are there, you can learn, well, no, we shouldn't do the same as that character. But uh, it's hard. There are some people working on this, but nothing like enough in my view. So how do we train the AIs? The other thing that may happen is that AIs may suddenly find ways of learning without reading so much data. Currently, the algorithms do depend on large amounts of data. Humans learn. A young child is able to distinguish between a dog and a cat without seeing a million cats and a million dogs. They somehow have more. A different algorithm, if you like, partly guided by evolution. We're not exactly sure how it works but this is sometimes called sparse data or sparse learning uh, rather than uh, this current systems and it may be that when we understand that suddenly that's going to be a faster way in which AIs will learn and again there's the risk of it going wrong in that it will suddenly draw the wrong conclusions much more quickly in the same way that a young child suddenly jumps to the wrong conclusions and they we have to say, oh, I know why you've said this, it sort of makes sense from your point of view but there's something you haven't appreciated yet so this education is going to be hard and challenging. Uh, maybe AI can help. That sounds a bit daft, but actually maybe one generation of AI, a, tr a bit of AI that is in some sense simpler and we can trust it, 
we, uh, but it's still smarter than us in some ways. Not smarter than us in a general way, but it's still very smart in some ways. Maybe that we can use as a guide to the forthcoming artificial general intelligence so we can get up stage by stage. And these uh, servant AIs can help to ensure that the more powerful AI, which comes next, uh, is guided to being friendly to humans or has, as we now tend to say, we have values that are aligned with the best of human values. Yes, yes, very true. Now, in a, in a world where technology change is constant and unpredictable, and we are advancing advancing so rapidly, not just you know in AI, but also in uh, uh, quantum computing, in gene editing, and nanotechnology, biotechnology, synthetic biology, uh, so many different areas, molecular manufacturing, 3D printing. So there are so many advances happening. So do you see that we have effective organizations that can lead this rapid change, uh, or you know we need some new organizations? to be able to manage these uh, rapid advances in technology? Well, I think many of the existing organizations are trying. Organizations like the IEEE, uh, IEEE, organizations like in Britain, the Royal Society or the Royal Society of Arts. There are some parliamentary organizations, mainly from, uh, in Britain, it's, we have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The House of Commons are the elected MPs. The House of Lords are people who are sort of retired from being in the House of Commons and also people appointed because of their expertise. People in the House of Lords uh, working with other parliamentarians worldwide have started to come up with some frameworks too to understand, but no, it's not going fast enough. So we have to encourage these organizations to see more clearly the radical possibilities. And I mean, this is the why some of them don't uh, put more focus on this. They somehow think, well, these scenarios that you and I are discussing now, they're too far off. They're not going to happen for a long time. So they can concentrate in the shorter term on other pressing issues. And there are pressing issues, which we touched on briefly as well, such as bias in present-day algorithms, uh, the need for people to be able to retrain more quickly from one uh, skills for one industry to the new skills for another industry. So people tend to focus on that. And I think that's very dangerous because... The kind of change that people might imagine will take 100 years could actually happen in just 10 or 20 years because of the acceleration effects that we talked about earlier on. So that's the first battle that's got to be fought. We've got to make people appreciate that there is at least a probability, not a certainty, but a probability that things will happen a lot faster. And one reason it can happen a lot faster is because, as you said, of the crossovers. There might be breakthroughs in gene editing or breakthroughs in virtual reality or breakthroughs in uh, self-driving cars, say, that somehow spark unexpected uh, consequences. Usually breakthroughs happen not because of one thing in one field, but because of several things happening, and then you get an unexpected development. So I think today it's like, it's been said we're living through the equivalent of a dozen Gutenberg moments at the same time, referring to Gutenberg's invention of the printing press back in, what was it, the 15th century, which led to huge changes in society, led to people distributing all kinds of information that was never accessible before. It led to the Reformation. It led to the Thirty Years' War. It led to the Enlightenment in due course. Well, people say that we are living through probably a dozen similar technological breakthroughs happening in parallel. And it's not just one or two, it's multiple things happening together. And it's because of that, that uh, there could be even faster breakthroughs. So let's get people thinking about the scenarios now, even though we're not certain what they'll be or even certain whether they'll happen, but it's much better to prepare than to suddenly wake up one day and say, oh, why didn't anybody warn us about this? Yes, very true, very true. We all need to come together, collaborate and cooperate because as we are creating this new intelligent species for our benefit, and if we are not all, you know, in tune in what we are, why are we trying to create another intelligent species? Then, you know, we are not doing justice and we are just bringing uh, more security risk towards us. And now there is also this growing concern about this AI singularity, when we reach there and 
that the there is going to be collapse of the world monetary system especially from the perspective that what good will money be if uh, if and when the artificial intelligence uh, technology singularity occurs and surpasses human capabilities in almost every facet of industry and it, producing anything and everything will become you know so much cheaper so the for capitalism two things will matter right one is labor and then the wages and here uh, the labor won't be required human labor because you know all these automation will uh, make uh, human labor obsolete and then you know without uh, uh, human labor where would the money come for humans to spend on you know for whatever they want to uh, what whatever they were trying for so uh, the capital capitalistic model is you know there are many uh, thought leaders uh, uh, saying that you know it's going to collapse in the coming years so uh, the world monetary system is you know likely going to collapse in the current form that we are uh, Uh, used to so what would happen you know how will the world operate and what will be the new form of, the, of that world where there will be no uh, wages and there will be no human labor so it's understandable that many people are afraid of such a possibility especially when they're used to thinking that uh, if people aren't working they are failures and national governments have got the view that if their unemployment rate is too high then they are failures Actually, I would say we should have a different expectation. We should look forward to a world in which nobody needs to work, in which the goal is full unemployment rather than full employment. Uh, and that could be done with uh, robots, artificial intelligence, uh, growing the food, uh, creating things uh, using nano factories and uh, new materials, gene, gene editing and so on. We can have an abundance of material goods and so on. but it's only going to be a positive development if we can truly distribute that amongst the whole earth's population and if uh, small groups of people want to hang on to disproportionate shares if they for example the the owners or the shareholders in a few companies that own the robots the googles or the successors of googles in the future if they want to hold on to all the earnings and then there'll be this uh, split in humanity there'll be a very small number doing very well and there'll be everybody else who in the words of the writer Yuval Noah Harari they will be the useless so the vision is the near gods and the mainly useless and that would be a terrible outcome i think but if we do it right then uh, there'll be the abundance which is generated can be shared around and probably we won't need much money anymore there may be a few things that are still relatively scarce perhaps there'll be some novelty from time to time and there might be some money to look after that but most of the economy will run instead in an abundance mode in which uh, it's freely distributed and let me very quickly show here this uh, i've written up some of these arguments in this uh, sustainable superabundance uh, and it looks at how it might be that we have enough food for healthy food for not just today's population but maybe a population many times larger than today's on the earth uh using lab grown meat instead of a uh, cow grown meat if you like which has many advantages using uh, nano factories to generate material goods and in which then people wouldn't need to work but we still have hobbies uh, very impor important hobbies things that you and I like to do now even though we're not paid for them uh people would still be doing that in the future and then it's uh could be a much better future and uh, if people throw up their hands and say well there wouldn't be the current financial system i say that's no big deal we don't need to worry too much about that provided and it's a very big provided provided the transition is managed wisely and of course it could go wrong in many ways and uh, we're already seeing it actually we're already seeing more people around the world are frustrated by missing out they can see that some of them are being left behind they can have a sense of lack of control and so the giot jones the riots in paris with the yellow yellow jackets the people choosing to vote for outrageous populist politicians around the world in some sense that's because they feel lack of control they're feeling left behind So we've got to reverse that trend. We've got to push towards uh, a sustainable abundance for all, uh, distributed regardless of whether people are quotes working and deserving or not. 
Yes, very true. No, and you made an excellent point that we do need to uh, manage this transition effectively because artificial intelligence brings us both promise and perils, risk and rewards. And as a human civilization, we need to make a very conscious effort to address all this disruption that is coming our way, irrespective of whether it is because of AI or is it because of gene editing or 3D printing or molecular manufacturing or synthetic biology. We have to manage each and every disruption that is coming our way. And the greatest challenge of our time is to manage that transition, like you said. So, and this discussion that we just had is not about making predictions on which year, you know, the singularity will happen or uh, who is going to uh, be the winner in that, which nation is going to lead. It is not about that, but rather to investigate uh, many different variables and scenarios and whether we believe that singularity is near or far that is irrelevant whether it's uh, likely or impossible that is also irrelevant but the ap apocalypse or uh, the challenges the serious ch security risks that are emerging and uh, coming for the future of the humanity the very idea that raises crucial security and risk questions for the future of the humanity, it forces us to think seriously about what we want as a human species. Because here we are trying to create another species that is going to be intel very intelligent or perhaps more intelligent than the human species. So we have to, as a you know, intelligent species ourselves, we have to start thinking about our own future. And then we have to think about all these different variables and scenarios. So having said that, what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners? And also, what if you can share some information about the book that you just uh, showed me, where they can you know go and purchase that book if they want to read that? So some people may say, having listened to our discussion, that there's an easy solution here, which is we just don't uh, create a new species. You know, we build AI as a tool, uh, but we don't give the AI any desires. We don't give it any autonomy. We just get it to do exactly what we tell it tell us to do. So that's one kind of approach. And I, I want to argue that, that just uh, doesn't work. I want to argue that uh, AI will have goals. We will ask AI to do various things for us. I'm working out uh, what's the uh, medical treatment for a particular problem, what's the way to route traffic, what's the way to design a new piece of engineering, and that almost uh, without us uh, planning it, the AI will have more power. It won't necessarily have the same kind of consciousness or sense of agency that you and I have, but it will have influence in the world. And by following either whatever rules we give it, it might accidentally cause the kind of havoc that you and I had uh, been talking about in this. So it may have bugs in its programming, it may have bugs in its specification. It may just be a consequence of what the humans ask it to do uh, when it interacts in some unexpected ways that will end up having these uh, adverse consequences. So there's no simple solution like that. So. In terms of positive solutions that might work, so maybe I can end with a couple of recommendations. I've already given the recommendation for collaborative intelligence. I don't think any one individual or any one group or any one uh, tradition and philosophy can solve these problems by ourselves. A very important skill for the future is collaborative intelligence. Well, related to that is the skill of agile intelligence. So now, agile means that you can change quite quickly, that you may experiment. We're not quite sure about these vast uncertainties in the future. Let's do a little experiment uh, in a short scale and then evaluate it quickly. And if it turns out that uh, what we learned was not what we expected, then you can reorient. And the opposite of um, agile is momentum or inertia. It's when you build up a very big project and you set it going and it's very difficult to stop and slow it down. And uh, I think we need more skills in Agile. And that may sound like a buzzword, but there is a whole discipline of Agile which grew out of software engineering, which can be applied in many other fields. Yes. Now, in order to do this, in order to have collaborative intelligence, in order to have Agile intelligence, we need one other kind of intelligence, which is emotional intelligence. It means that we're willing to say, actually, I was wrong. You know, I had this idea and I was wrong. We're willing to embrace risks. We're willing to learn from new, new things. Many of us, sadly, have got 
issues in various parts of our emotional systems which prevent us from uh, being sufficiently open and sufficiently agile and sufficiently collaborative. But the good news is that uh, AI can help us with emotional intelligence too, can coach us, and also there are other techniques, uh, historical, well-worn techniques to improve emotional intelligence, which can now with modern technology maybe be compressed and people can become more emotionally intelligent more quickly, if not yet today, but in the near future. And some of this I've written about, as, I, as you kindly mentioned, in Sustainable Superabundance, which I've written here as a universal transhumanist invitation. It's an invitation to everybody to merge the insights from multiple uh, cultures on a transhumanist basis, which means we can go beyond where we are today. We can get into a better situation. We're no longer subject to aging. We're no longer su subject to collective stupidity, to abuses of power, and to the tendencies of depression and alienation and envy and ego. So that's a transhumanist vision. People can find out more about that online. Google for me, David Wood, futurist. Google for sustainable superabundance. Go to Amazon or other online sources. Find out more about what London Futurist is doing too, or just Google for transhumanism. There's a set of ideas, uh, sometimes it's got that name, transhumanism, that current day humanity is not the end desirable point of a intelligent life, that we can collectively, intelligently evolve ourselves with help from uh, technology, with help from AIs to a better, a more wonderful, truly more wonderful, profoundly more wonderful future. Yes, absolutely. No, that's wonderful. And uh, like you said, you know, none of us know uh, uh, everything. We all know something, though. So if we, like you said, if we have a collaborative, collective effort, there is a lot that we as a human species can achieve. So thank you so much, David, for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on technological singularity. And our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from what you had to say and from the from the information you provided on AI driven technological singularity and the future of humanity. So even if a single individual or entity can come up with an idea to prevent the complex security risk facing humanity based on the understanding they received from the discussion we had today, this risk round of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. My pleasure. You asked a great set of questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. So Risk Roundup, a global initiative launched by Risk Group, is a security risk reporting for risk emerging from existing and emerging technologies, technology conversions, and transformation happening across cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace, they all walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, Risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the Risk Roundups, to watch the Risk Roundup webcast or hear the Risk Roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.